AI and many core architectures in advanced scientific computing applications. So he was awarded the Intel Doctoral Student Honor Program Award in 2012. And together with Intel Labs um, and APRO, now part of the CRAE and NICS, he placed the Bacon system um, in November 12, Green 500 list. In 2013, he and his co-authors received the PRESS ISC 2013 award for their publication 591 Teraflops Multitrillion Particle Simulation on SuperMU. Uh, he and his co-authors were awarded the 2014 PRESS ISC award uh, for their paper sustained Metastical performance of seismic simulations with size call on super mu. So today we'll be talking about the higher order seismic simulation at sustained petascale. So let's welcome Alexander. Thank you. So it should work for it. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Let go down. So thank you very much for this uh, nice introduction today. Yeah, so that's basically my first talk I'm giving as an Intel employee. And that's why I think I have to start with this slide. So I don't know, right? So basically, I'm saying everything is just on behalf of me and not on behalf of Intel. And there is an optimization notice. So I think we're going to go to the next slide, which are the acknowledgments. So first of all, I want to thank my colleagues at Intel. As you heard, we did a lot of optimization on Intel hardware in the last couple of years. And basically, these three guys, I think Karsik should be quite familiar to the group here. He helped us a lot. And Mike Samiansky and Pradeep Dubey also from Intel Labs. And of course, I want to thank our colleagues around the world supporting us when running uh, our application on their supercomputing. For instance, Bill Burrs in the back right, he volunteered, I think, in the morning hours to run the work we are presenting today on Stampede and then to the several grants we were using. And of course, I somehow borrowed a couple of figures and slides in my talk from my former colleagues. I tried to cite as much as possible, but please excuse if I didn't, this, didn't do this that correctly, right, in some cases. So in order, since the slides are um, uh, broadcasted afterwards, I added some reference to our latest work. So most of the work I'm talking today about is our recent paper, which isn't released so far. It will be published at Supercomputing as a Golden Bell finalist presentation. And we used, of course, MBA pitch for this work. And the second one was the, the Praise Award, which is already available in public. Uh, I also added the PDF link. So if you are willing to read it, just feel free and download the paper. And the last three ones are just presentations, but I borrowed slides from them so that I can cite them. So first of all, I think we talked about this in the last talk, right? So why should we do earthquake simulations? I think the best example was just 48 hours ago, right? So we had a big earthquake in the Bay Area. And we do not want to predict earthquakes, right? You cannot predict earthquakes. They're just happening. We're just waiting for them. But what we can do, we can save our lives uh, by building and constructing buildings which are earthquake safe. And therefore, we need a big, good understanding about uh, the, the rupturing and the, the ground motion, the shaking of the, of the soil, right? And therefore, the California Earthquake Center said in 2013, going on now, we need dynamic representations of fault ruptures, and we need high frequencies in the ground shaking. And this means 10 hertz for the frequencies. And I just realized this 48 hours ago, what 6 hertz mean, right? When you're lying in the bed 3 o'clock in the morning. So what does Sysol do? So what we do, uh, we do a full elastic wave equation in 3D using complex geometries and heterogeneous media to capture all the things happening in the Earth during the rupturing. We do this dynamic rupturing, what was in the last slide, as the motivation for the next couple of years. And we do the thing in high order. So the motivation for high order, basically, is you know finite difference codes are memory bound in these days. If you, can, you have free flops available, so why not using them for doing more computation and more accurate computations? In order to keep this overhead as low as possible, uh, we shoot for unstructured theoretical meshes. This, of course, has tremendous implications on your communication infrastructure, as we will see afterwards, since we have now also unstructured communication. And you also need highly optimized kernels, since part of our compute kernels may now be compute bound. And so we have to be really careful when tuning these codes on modern architectures to employ vector registers and so on. 
And we have to do everything, of course, massively parallel due to the high computational demand of the simulations. Therefore, I will just give you a quick outline of what I'm talking about today. I give the background of size or the mathematical one. Then I talk about the optimizations in terms of compute, communication, and I.O., of course. So we do not run benchmarks. Here we want to simulate an earthquake. That means we generate terabytes of data during simulation in order to visualize them afterwards. So we have to deal with this. And I will give you basically our three most important uh, uh, application scenarios, including the Gordon Bell scenario. And, of course, we conclude the work. In this pre presentation, I will use two supercomputer facilities. One is SuperMOOC. I don't know if you heard about this. It's one of the biggest installations in Europe. It's a three petaflop machine. And you can think about it as a stampede being 1.5 in the size, and you cancel out the Xeon Fi devices. So it's just a CPU-based machine, and it's 1.5 times bigger than Stampede from the base cluster installation point of view. So a bit of math now, right? So we start with the standard basic elastic wave equations in SciSol. And now we discretize them in a discontinuous Galerkin formulation, which means you split up your domain into small parts. These are tetrahedrons, so it's not basically accidental that we call them TK. And in order to advance from the time step to the next, we have to integrate over these time steps. That's all. Right? It's, it's a bit more complicated, but that's basically all you have to do. And you end up with the blue and the, and the, the, the red boxes. And these are basically the integration parts you have to do in order to do time integration. And what you can see here, they are dependent on the same operator, which is called i n to n plus 1 k. And that means you do the actual advancing in time in the element basis. So that's just happening locally. There's no communication, nothing involved. And you see, the v k, it's quite simple. I just need the local part. And for the boundary integration, I just need the local part and my four neighbors. You see the tetrahedron has four faces, and I need to compute the fluxes on these faces for the wave equation. That's everything. So what we currently see on this slide here is the main compute kernel of SISO. The SIORA means all the things may be compute bound, and the communication structure is really unstructured here. Right? I need my four face neighbors, and since my, my mesh is unstructured, I can have one neighbor on an MPI process basis. I can have 30 neighbors. I can have kilobytes to send. I can have 40 megabytes to send. So I have to deal with all these kinds of issues afterwards. The time integration part is basically the main kernel. As we saw, it's this I operator. And this is a Taylor series, essentially defined on matrix operations. So what we can see here is we just iterate over the subparts of the matrix. You see the small triangulars. And you just start with the biggest one, and then you can do this for smaller and smaller matrices, and you have to efficiently exploit this when implementing the kernels. The same is for the flux. However, it's a bit more complicated. So this is, as I said, we have the first part. These are the four big matrices where you have to compute the fluxes within the element. And then, depending on my mesh and where I am, I have to select out of 48 matrices how to get the contribution of the other elements. And please note, these other elements, they are somewhere in memory on our own remote host, right? So you have to take care for this. So here we have unstructured computation. All the other computation is really structured. And the volume kernel, it's the same as before. So it's just using the time integrated unknowns and multiplying it. So we can now summarize. We need. When you now count all these matrices, 56 different matrices, we need to multiply to some dense matrices, and we have some sparse matrices from the, from the right. So we, have, we need a firework, basically, of matrix operations and matrix-tuned kernels just to, get, to handle the compute side. And then we need to handle all these different communication patterns. And of course, this is just wave equation, so there is no rupturing inside. It's just traveling waves through some media. So we need to introduce dynamic rupture here. And this is a multiphysic problem then. And we do this in a monolithic case. And that means we implement this as a boundary condition. And you saw the only boundary part which is happening is the boundary integration itself. And that means we just disable the spaces here, which are doing dynamic rupture, and add a different compute kernel. So all of these complex boundary integration we now add 
a specific compute kernel which basically disturbs our system even more from a programmatic point of view. So this disturption is wanted from a physical point of view because we want to have this rupturing and we want to simulate this rupturing, of course. But it's really a headache if you want to implement this at scale. The kernel routines, what we did so far, is, uh, if you release a kernel library associated with the Sysdl and we currently are on the third release, and the third release now handles all Intel instruction set extensions, of course, and due to this optimization, we were able to speed up Sysdl over the uh, original version by 5x on a standard CPU platform. And if you, for instance, use the CO2 microprocessor, you can get basically another 2x compared to a standard, currently used Sandy Bridge host. I want to go into details here because that's not the topic of this meeting here to talk about kernel optimizations. We are talking now more about mesh optimization than IO optimization. So the main issue is basically if you have an unstructured mesh, how do I basically map it to a supercomputer nowadays, right? So this is now as an example on the, the SuperMOOC computer, uh, which has 5,216 uh, uh, nodes. So what we do, we say, okay, we go with a hybrid approach in order to, to lower the, the amount of MPI processes in the partition we have to handle, right? And if you would read in the thing just as a big file that doesn't scale. So you have to do a lot of preparation work, and that's exactly what a colleague of mine, Sebastian Rettenberger, is doing during his PhD thesis, which is currently going on. Uh, he, he came up with a new file format based on NetCDF, which we see down there. It's a 3D padded NetCDF file format where you basically have the partitions, the vertices, and the elements per partition. And all thing is padded so that you basically meet all the, 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 the alignment requirements of MPIIO and then the underlying file system. For instance, we're using GPFS, so you need to align everything to eight megabyte pages and so on. So basically, we do this, pay some overhead for this, but as you can see, it pays off. So if we take, this is the, 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 the IC paper, where we have a mesh of 100 million elements, which is quite huge, so we're talking about nearly one terabyte here. Uh, we convert this in roughly 45 minutes on four Sandy Bridge nodes, which you can do on your department, even on a normal desktop machine if you have enough RAM available. This takes a negligible amount of time. Then we have this new mesh, <laughs> and then if we go to our supercomputer, to our 150K cores, we read the mesh in six seconds. So basically, the setup phase is six seconds here. Just finding a correct uh, input here. For instance, the original code, RAT, would not be able to read this file in the 48 hours work clock time, which you can get on the supercomputer for a job, right? So you cannot read it at all. I think we had some other speed ups earlier this morning. Just doing it right and leveraging all the features we have is exactly what we are doing here. The other thing is MPI optimization. So we have an unstructured mesh, as I said, and this results in unstructured communication patterns. And how this was implemented before, we can see it down there. So we do not know what's happening. So of course, we have to allocate the MPI buffers. Then we gather the data we want to send to each of the other processors. Then we do our send-receive non-blocking. And then we scatter the data on the receiving host, and then we have to deal with the MPI buffers. However, what we were able to find out, we can use persistent communication. And what I found out, that nobody basically uses persistent communication because people say it doesn't matter. I will show data that exactly in these cases of unstructured meshes, where you know who is going to communicate over 1,000 or 100,000 of time steps is really matters, especially if you have um, RDMA on InfiniBand, where you have this registration overhead that you can get rid of all these registration overheads, right? Yeah. So many people used this copy for in Blue Gene. They had no problems with doing all this allocation and deallocation of MPI, but was going to, to, to commodity clusters using InfiniBand and having really strong scaling scenarios, you will see that it really matters going to this persistent communication. So that's why Cypher was known and is selected as a benchmark in Europe, often for procurements, it scales just. You can run on each machine and it just scales. But we can show having the speed up of five to six on the compute side, it doesn't scale anymore, right? So we had really to look into this. And I have a nice 
presentation afterwards on the slide where we basically show what we did on the MPI level to get it somehow scaling again, right? And that's what we now do. The other thing is you can now fill MPI buffers in parallel. So as I said, you have to copy a lot of data up to 40 megabytes. We need basically to fill the buffers in parallel and using something like MPI data type doesn't work out here since we can just use single thread and we cannot rely on a threading library. And that's why it's also help using persistent communication. We know where our buffers are. We can just parallelize and copy with up to 60 megabytes, uh, gigabytes per second into the communication buffers, which helps a lot. And of course, uh, we had this discussion today and we started uh, running the code in symmetric and then we ran into a lot of issues with CM5, right? So it works on 1,000 cards, it works on 2,000 cards, but going really to scale, and that means going to the size of Stampede, for instance, in symmetric mode, there are issues in the MPI implementations. So they are on, in the Intel MPI, and yeah, the Embarkage MPI. So basically, we have startup issues, and everything is happening here. So we said, OK, to have some reliable version, which runs on every machine, with good performance, and we have this multi-physics component, uh, we just come up with an offload scheme. And that's just what I want to cover here in a bit. Uh, so what we do, we want this regular compute part on the Xeon 5 because it's really compute bound. We have massive amounts of compute. Then we run the MPI communication on the host, overlap with all this compute, and we run this complex dynamic rupture curve on the CPU too because here we have a lot of instructions which are not vectorizable, we have a lot of divisions, we have a lot of square roots to compute, so we need high frequencies and single thread performance for doing this. So this naturally fits basically the cluster, but the important thing is we started from a native execution model, that means what we are doing here, we do some kind of reverse offload, what you could find in the days of cell, right? So basically after the initialization phase, the entire execution is handed over to the C on Phi core processor, and we just wrote basically inspired by Karsik and therefore also by the MPI Wappage team, um, some reverse offload proxy, which was just implemented directly in our application, uh, matching our needs here. So, but it's basically just a reverse offload proxy on application layer, what we do. And here are basically the, the optimization I was talking about. So the first Big run on side for the size on SuperMOOC. We did for SC13 for a poster presentation, and we were at close to one teraflop. So we were really, was really sad for us that we had to go to SC13 with 980 teraflops, right? We had just the first release of the kernels, and you see there are some dips in the in the scalings, right? So it goes from 40 percent to something like 30 percent peak performance. And by C14. We improved a bit on the kernel, so you see it's 10% more performance on the kernel side. But then we did these MPI optimizations, going to persistent communication, threaded buffer handlings, and so on. And you see immediately up to eight, uh, up to 16,000 nodes from 8,000 to 16,000 nodes, everything is fine. And this dip here, this has nothing to do with MPI. It's just the architect architecture of Superbook. So. It has 512 nodes bundled together in an FDR fat tree, and then you basically have just a quarter of bandwidth available to go to the next island of 18 islands. That means you do not have enough bandwidth to, to saturate the demand you have here. So you cannot do anything about this. It's a physical limit here due to the network architecture. And for SC14, we did some optimization on the physical level. In the application, we really changed the physics. Can you see then another? 12 or 14% are possible in, in terms of peak performance. And you see, basically, it's like a long hanging fruit, right? You started with the compute, which you can easily do, then you did some analyzation on the MPI, and then, oh, it's still not scaling that good, so now I go to the physics. I really change the science I'm doing in order to get more scalability. For IC14, I also want to present now the, the Stampede results. So these are now including everything, also the Xeon 5 processor. Right, so that's why the peak performance is a bit lower using Stampede than SuperMOOC since we cannot leverage the full performance of Xeon Phi. Although we have matrix operations, these matrix operations are 
rather small size. So we're talking about matrices of dimension 50 and 9, right? So you cannot really leverage the entire register for file of C on 5. So you end up on a high level of a performance like 60 to 70 percent peak. So you're far away from that what Linpack can do on such a machine. And that's why you have lower peak here. But you can see basically some peak feels nicer than SuperMOOC, but that's expected since you, the oversubscription on the Infinibin network we read this morning is just 5 over 4, so it's much smaller than on SuperMOOC. Although you can see on the right hand side, we are using MPI, Infinibin, IBM MPI on SuperMOOC. You see that the efficiency and all of the scalability on Stampede is higher, right? So they were using MPI advantage. It's small, but it's higher, of course, and we have a better overlap here. And it's due to faster persistent communication and the better network. I said, OK, how much does the MPI really pay off, these MPI optimizations, uh, using this persistent communication? And that's what we're showing here. So I tried to gather the right figures. The one is SC13, the other one is ISC14. And you see on the right hand side, we just used the original scale, the original implementation using <coughs> the uh, asynchronous communication. And the right hand side uses persistent communication. And you basically see now the strong scaling scenario. We are somewhere around 20% on, on 4K nodes of uh, peak performance. And with the new implementation, we have 35%. So we're basically doubling the performance using the MPI optimizations, right? That everything here is percentage of peak performance, so that's why this basically performance double. And what we see down there, this is the classic version of Samsung. And we see there were no scaling issues at all with this version, right? So this was strong scaling here. So this was always okay. Our network, we have just a quarter of bandwidth available. Okay, you have this anyway. Now coming to our scenario which we simulated for Ron Bell. Uh, this is one of the biggest uh, earthquakes ever happened in California. And it's quite complicated to simulate since it not has just one fault that ruptures. It has several faults that ruptured. And basically, we have jumps between these faults. So you have a fault that is rupturing. You will see this in the video. And then suddenly, another fault ruptures because there was some wave transportation happening in the Earth. And then the other fault, oh, there's an earthquake going on, I also will rupture now, right? Exactly that happened here, and that we were able to simulate in our approach. That's just possible because you have this monolithic, complete simulation of the wave equations right next to the, to the fault process. So basically, how we simulated the thing is we took now a mesh of 200 million tetraedians. That means, now on a strong scale, that you just have 1,300 elements per core on the super MOOC. It's just 130 elements per C on 5 thread. So this is really strong scaling here. You're talking about a couple of megabytes per process, which you are working on. And we did a production run on super MOOC. We have done it on the so far. We're looking forward to it. But due to the amount of compute, it takes some couple of hours, right? It's quite hard to get resources on it. So we did over 200,000 time steps, which resulted in 42 seconds of simulated time. We ran this simulation with 23 pick points. So that means we, we call it the, the waves which are arriving. You see this pick points here on the map. And we also had out output enabled during the simulation in order to visualize and to understand what is happening afterwards. In total, it took us seven, seven hours to run on SuperMOOC. It was an entire night. So the system was stable for an entire night. Just for your information, uh, the Linpack run on this machine was three hours. And the overall implementation, the overall runtime was at, or the overall simulation was running at 1.25 petaflops, including the MPI start up, including the initialization, and including the output happening, right? So this is really sustained petaflop simulation. So it's not just running a benchmark. And we were able to gather frequency up to 10 hertz. Let's see if this works. So I have a video with me. There you basically see. So this is now the desert in California where this earthquake was happening. And you see here is the actual mesh we simulated. Right? So there you see all the tetraedrons. And now this is the port. And now you see the adaptivity. 
and the resolution on the fault is just 200 meters. Remember, the fault is 40, 85 kilometers long and 15 kilometers deep, and the resolution is 200 meters. And here you can see the adaptivity of the mesh and this complex geometry of the fault. That's, as I said, where the number of times that we simulated. And there you now see basically the rupture of the fall. And it's quite similar to the video, video we saw before. You see basically how the waves were emitted from the fall and how waves, you see it, wet is bad, of course, and how they are traveling like, you know, like I said, the full stone in the water, exactly what you see. And now we come to this fall output, right? And that's why I say you see there the fall starting to rupture. And now you suddenly will see here the fault, there's no end. But you see at the, on, the, on the other side of the other fault, it just starts rupturing, right? And there's the fault branching. You see there the fault basically is connected to another fault, and you branch into all these different faults, and they start rupturing. And that's exactly what we saw in reality in 1992. And that's what you can do with this code. That's the only code right now which basically can these simulations. So basically it's a... Uh Near neighbor kind of pattern. Yes, so the, the communication pattern is near neighbor pattern. But as I said, uh, you can have three neighbors, you can have 30 neighbors, you can send 10 elements, you can say 10, you can send 10,000 elements. And the thing gets even worse, what we will see in the next couple of slides. And uh, when, uh, when you say you use partition uh, like, uh, memory, do you use like an RMA one, like a big data window, or uh, uh, we, we can do this up front since the mesh is adaptive, but it's static. Okay. Adaptive. So the mesh is not changing. We know where the fault basically is, and there we okay. put more in. Okay. We put more elements in, so the mesh is not changing at all. Okay. So that's why we can use easily persistent communication, also RMA windows going one side, and so on. So this is basically what I will show in my outlook. Okay, so okay. Okay. These are now just uh, the, the scaling plots, and you can see we can enhance all this, this physics and all this stuff on the heterogeneous system <coughs> using MPI roughly G on Stampede and using MP IBM MPI on Super Mode. And you see the overall scalability in the strong scaling scenario. Remember, we had 1,000 elements on Sandy Bridge before, and just 130 elements per uh, uh, CL5 red. So we develop up 80% strong scaling scalability from 256 nodes to the full system size. What I want now quickly cover in order to see that the communication works out, we did some weird performance modeling, right? So you can say you have to overlap this, then you can do this, and you can do that. So just to show you it's quite complicated, right? What you can do. But what I want to say is basically. <laughs> You see here that then we are in this strong scale scenario, full scale, you see the communication even exceeds our time where we can overlap, right? So there is nothing we can do here, but we have still some time left because we can rearrange the application what we already did, but we did run this on 2000 nodes and it doesn't help because here all the calls for the site we can provide to you, you need to go to the machine to do it. You see our phone call is just one percent off, but the important thing here is we have just one gigabyte of bandwidth on a processor's basis, including all this queue since we have this adaptive mass, we have this different amount of data we have to send, and we have to send data which is here in Stampede to a node which is there in Stampede, right? Because we do not have any knowledge about the mesh, right? And that's why the overall band is we are getting we can get here for this now is one gigabytes per second on a network which should basically deliver something like four including all this oversubscriptions, right? So we lose basically seventy five percent due to imbalances in the so communication. Basically what you're trying to say is that with the quality of very nothing you would be able to integrate yes. all these issues. Exactly. Okay. Just to close the talk, I want to talk what's, what it really means all this work for the scientist, because the scientist doesn't care about all this optimization as long as you say, okay, what can you get out of this? And that means on SuperMook, they are now able to solve the problems five to six times faster. So on Stampede, they're even able to solve problems 11 times faster of the same size. What 
Other, on the other hand, means they can run 11 times bigger problems right now to gather more insights. And for C on 5, it means uh, we can increase the performance by a factor of 2 going to Stampede, and that means tripling the flops results in a doubling of performance on an application level, which is quite excellent for an accelerator architecture. So, and now the future work is local time stepping. What we did is just global time stepping. We have an adaptive mesh, so there is something like CFL condition. I don't know if somebody heard about this. It means you can do different time steps in different parts of the mesh, which, reduce, which results in different communication patterns in different parts of the mesh. And then everything gets even more unstructured. And what we're currently trying to look here is if RDMA one-sided is the only, so currently is basically the only promising approach doing this at scale. For neighbor, neighborhood collectives, we don't know. And we need improved partitioning. And of course, as we already discussed here, uh, topology aware process mapping is required to guarantee scaling to even more nodes, since we currently are suffer from exactly problems. And it's especially what happens if you go to Cascades networks, so, so Taurus networks and so on. So it's because we have this unstructured mesh, there are really a lot of problems here. And on the compute side, we need to develop new kernels, probably new strategies for kernel fusion to leverage processors like Haskell, which will be announced in a couple of weeks, or the Xeon Pi successor, code name like Landing. So we heard Tech is doing, is doing something on this. There is some announcement in, in Berkeley. So we need to think about what doing next from this perspective here. So does the code that avoids the overhead of uh, packing and packing inside the uh, sites are uh, available? Yes. So in order to conclude, so what we showed you, there are significant speed ups uh, um, possible today, but you have to do basically kernel and computation optimize and communication optimization, but in the end you can run at sustained peak performance, uh, sustained kind of performance. What we can see, what we can do with this is optimize, we can run new science. That's our paper right now. So during all this, the important thing is what we also heard before in the talk. Yes, we need this because we have to run this new science problem, so we have to care about this. And the proof of example basically here is um, for the best performance, it doesn't matter what you're, in what system you are, you now have to basically regard the entire simulation pipeline. It means you have to care about I.O., initialization, then you have to care about the communication, and then you have to care about uh, the, the kernel implementation. So you basically have to to rewrite your application from scratch, or at least to tune your application from scratch. And you have to also look into startups things, and that's what we also had. So basically, we are not currently in this problem with having MPI startup pros, but going to even larger clusters, this would be also a problem. So we have to basically we got the entire problem. And as I said, you also have to optimize the physics. Okay. So that's all, and thank you very much, and I'm happy to take questions. Uh, quick questions, yes. Uh, Ethan, uh, there's a microphone, maybe? Holding the yeah. So I have a question.